Good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Archer. I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband program here at the London School of Economics. And I'm absolutely delighted to um, welcome our speaker today, Professor Gary Gerstel. Gary Gerstel is currently the Professor of American History Emeritus at Cambridge University and also the Director of Research in American History there. And he's previously taught at numerous institutions, especially in the United States, um, most recently Vanderbilt University. But he's held all sorts of fellowships at Princeton, at Pennsylvania, in Oxford, in Paris. And many of you may have read his work in more widespread venues. You can find his writings in newspapers in multiple countries, in magazines, in the broadcast media, and now also in podcasts. Um, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that Gary Gerstel is one of the most eminent historians of 20th century American history. Um, his influence can be seen in a whole range of his writings. He's produced some, I think, 12 books and countless articles. And I won't go through all those books today, but give you a feeling of his influence by noting how his early work on class formation and labor politics, especially in his book, Working Class Americanism, shaped that debate. Our later work on race, immigration, and nation formation, notably in his prize-winning The American Crucible, helped shape debates in that area. And then more recently, work on American political ideas and political institutions, notably his liberty and coercion, which won the American Organization of Historians Prize for an outstanding piece in American political history how that shaped that debate. So there's an incredible breadth to the influence of Professor Gerstel's writings. Well, this is the first of our Miliband series this year, and the theme is um, the world unmade. And it's hard to imagine a better speaker to kick us off because today Gary's gonna to draw on some of the arguments from his just published book, the rise and fall of the neoliberal order. And it's easy to see how important that is as we live through the upcoming half-term elections and the absolute turmoil of the trust government. Well, uh, Gary's gonna be speaking for about 45 or 50 minutes, then we'll have a good chunk of time for questions and discussion. But before we do that, can I ask you to join me in welcoming to the LSC, Professor Gary Gerstel. Range contraption. Good evening. Can you hear me well? Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the London School of Economics. I want to thank Robin Archer and the other members of the committee of the Mil Miliband series for inviting me. You should know that uh, the London School of Economics has a <clears throat> special place in my heart. You now know, if you didn't already, that I'm an American. Uh, and uh, I came to the London School of Economics when I was 20 years old, 1974, 75, a little smaller than it is today. There was no new academic building. There were just old academic buildings. And it was, it's wonderful to see how, um, how flourishing a university this has become. It's also great to see you in person. I understand this is the first in-person uh, lecture uh, since the pandemic began. And I'm someone myself who is encouraging the primacy or stressing the primacy of in-person contact. We had no idea how many people would actually be here tonight as opposed to Zooming in. So I'm really delighted to see uh, so many of you. Uh, when I was at the LSE, um, I, I, I was reading history, British economic history, international relations, American economic history, American political history. 
Uh, and um, this is the place where I first began to think that maybe there is an academic career in my future. I say that as someone who doesn't come from an academic background, there were no academics in my family. I'm what's called in the US now, first gen, first generation college student. It was all really fresh and new to me in, it, in the beginning, incomprehensible. But the year I spent here was just so exciting and so full and so rich that uh, it steered me toward an academic career. Uh, and it also uh, made me desire at some point to come back and spend um, part of my career in the UK. Never actually thought it would happen, and then it did. So I'm closing in on my 10th year at the University of Cambridge and just am very grateful for the opportunity this country and the institutions here have given me. And of course, uh, London is the most fabulous city in the world. I'm gonna be speaking about my uh, new book and, um, uh, and it does have some contemporary <laughs> resonance. Um, I also want to take a moment to uh, just uh, indicate my esteem for the Miliband family. The sons are well known, of course. I don't know how well Ralph Miliband, the father, is known. To I don't know if he's still being read, but uh, in the 1980s, when I was trying to figure out the world, one of the issues I was trying to figure out is was what is the relationship of the state to the economy, how to understand political power in relationship to economic power. And one of the people doing the most interesting work on that subject was Ralph Miliband. Uh, so he's been with me for a long time. That topic was much too tough for me to tackle in the 1980s and 90s. So I put it aside for 25 years and then came back to it in 2015. Uh, but he was a great inspiration to me. And thus, it was, it's a great honor to be part of this series. Across the second decade of the 21st century, the tectonic plates structuring American politics and life began to shift. Even before the pandemic struck, developments that 10 years earlier would have seemed inconceivable now dominated politics and popular consciousness. The election of Donald Trump and the launch of a presidency like no other, the rise of Bernie Sanders and the resurrection of the socialist, socialist left in the United States, the sudden and deep questioning of open borders and free trade, the surge of populism and ethno-nationalism and the castigation of once celebrated globalizing elites, the decline of Barack Obama's stature and the transformational promise that his presidency once embodied for so many, and the widening conviction that the American political system was no longer working and that American democracy was in crisis, a crisis at the January 6, 2021, assault by a mob on the Capitol, so shockingly demonstrated. In this dizzying array of political developments, I discern the fall, or at least the fracturing of a political order that took shape in the 1970s and 80s and achieved dominance in the 1990s and first decade of the 21st century. I call this political formation a neoliberal order. Republican Ronald Reagan was its ideological architect. Democrat Bill Clinton was its key facilitator. My book attempts to be a history of that political order's rise and fall. It offers a history of our time. The phrase political order is meant to connote a constellation of ideologies, policies, and constituencies that shape American politics in way that, ways that endure beyond the two, four, and six year election cycles. In the last hundred years, America has had two political orders, the New Deal order that arose in the 1930s and 40s, crested in the 1950s and 60s, and fell in the 1970s and the neoliberal order that arose in the 1970s and 80s crested in the 1990s and 2000s and fell in the 20 teens. At the heart of each of these political orders stood a distinctive program of political economy. The New Deal order was founded on the conviction that capitalism left to its own devices spelled economic disaster. It had to be managed by a strong central state able to govern the economic system in the public interest. The neoliberal order, by contrast, was grounded in the belief that market forces had to be liberated from government regulatory controls that were stymieing growth, innovation, and freedom. The architects of the neoliberal order set out in the 1980s and 1990s to dismantle everything that the New Deal order had built across its 40-year span. Now it, too, is being dismantled. 
Establishing a political order demands far more than winning an election or two. It requires deep pocketed donors to invest in promising candidates over the long term. It requires the establishment of think tanks and policy networks to turn political ideas into actionable programs. It requires a rising political party able to durably win over multiple electoral constituencies. It requires a capacity to shape po political opinion, both at the highest levels, think the Supreme Court, and across popular print and broadcast media. And it requires a moral perspective able to inspire voters with visions of a good life. Political orders, in other words, are complex projects that require advances across a broad front. front. New ones do not arise very often. Usually they appear when an older order founders amidst an economic crisis that then precipitates a governing crisis. Stagflation precipitated the fall of the New Deal order in the 1970s. The Great Recession of 2008-2009 triggered the fracturing of the neoliberal order in the 20-teens. A key attribute of a political order is the ability of its ideologically dominant party to bend the opposition party to its will. Bending of this sort comes to be perceived as necessary within the ranks of politicians competing for the top prizes in American politics, the presidency and control of Congress. Thus, the Republican Party of Dwight D. Eisenhower acquiesced to the core principles of the New Deal in the 1950s, and the Democratic Party of Bill Clinton accepted the central principles of the neoliberal order in the 1990s. Acceptance is never complete. There are always points of tension and vulnerability in a polity as fissiparous as the American one. And yet the success of a political order depends on its proficiency in shaping what broad majorities of elected officials and voters on both sides of the partisan divide regard as politically possible and desirable. By the same token, losing the capacity to exercise ideological hegemony signals a political order's decline. In these moments of decline, political ideas and programs formerly regarded as radical, heterodox, or unworkable, or, dis or dismissed as a product of the overheated imaginations of fringe groups on the right and left, are able to move from the margins into the mainstream. This happened in the 1970s when the breakup of the New Deal order allowed long scorn neoliberal ideas for reorganizing the economy to take root. It happened again in the 20 teens when the coming apart of the neoliberal order opened up space for Trump style authoritarianism and Sanders style socialism to flourish. To describe the sort of dominance that a political order can achieve, I sometimes invoke Gramsci's concept of hegemony, but my work draws equally if silently on Thomas Kuhn's classic work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. <laughs> Paradigms of knowledge as articulated by Kuhn structure not just science, but political thought and possibility as well. Steve Fraser and I introduced the concept of political order in the American context in a 1989 book that we co-edited, The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order, 1930 to 1980. Since that time, the phrase New Deal Order has become a popular one for underscoring the dominance that the New Deal and the Democratic Party exercised in American politics from the 1930s through the 1960s. I begin my book with an account of how that earlier political order arose how it achieved prominence in the 30s and 40s, and how it fell apart in the 1960s and 70s. This is no simple retelling of the history contained in the Fraser Burstall Collection, published in 1989, after all, long before many of you were born. Rather, this narrative incorporates my own rethinking of key elements of that story. Reaching back to the New Deal order at the beginning of my book also serves a useful purpose of throwing into sharp relief how much the neoliberal order of recent times has differed from what preceded it. I then turn to the main event itself, the construction of the neoliberal order. The story unfolds in three acts. The first is the rise in the 1970s and 80s of Ronald Reagan and the free market Republican party he forced into being. The second is the emergence in the 1990s of Bill Clinton as the Democratic Eisenhower the man who arranged his party's acquiescence to the neoliberal order. And the third explores George W. Bush's determination to apply neoliberal principles everywhere in projects as radically dissimilar as building a post-Saddam Hussein Iraq 
and making America a more racially egalitarian nation. Bush's attempt to universalize the implementation of neoliberal principles was born more of hubris than of a serious reckoning with the problems at hand and eventually pushed the US economy into its worst crisis since the Great Depression. But Bush's hubris reveals not just the flaws of a man, but also the unassailable prestige of neoliberal principles an influence that Barack Obama's election in 2008 initially did little to change. Two final chapters consider the political explosions that issued from the Great Recession of 2008-2009. The, the Tea Party, which was thunder on the right, Occupy Wall Street, which was thunder on the left, Black Lives Matter, and the rise of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. These movements emerging from the economic crisis of 2008-2009 pushed the neoliberal order to its breaking point. The neoliberal order was already fragmenting when the 2020 pandemic delivered the coup de grace. My book tells the whole of the neoliberal's, neoliberal order story from its origins in the 1970s and 80s through its dominance in the 1990s and 2000s and ending with its fragmentation and decline across the 20 teens. I was still writing the end of the book, trying to figure out what to write at the end of the book in January 2022, and the book actually published in March of 2022. And the last few pages are already outdated. In the United States, conservatism has long been the preferred term to frame the political developments that are at the heart of my book. Why then label the political order that dominated America in the late 20th and early 21st centuries a neoliberal order rather than a conservative one? That choice on my part deserves some explanation. Conservatism in the classical sense signifies respect for tradition, deference to existing institutions and the hierarchies that structure them, and suspicion of change. Change that does happen is meant to happen organically from within existing institutions slowly, responsibly, and in ways that preserve rather than subvert a society's conservative character. One can find manifestations of these conservative ideas in American politics across the second half of the 20th century, most importantly in the widespread determination among white Southerners to maintain racial privilege in an era of civil rights, and among Americans throughout the country who in the name of tradition were pushing back against liberation movements calling for equal rights for women and gays, and for sexual freedom. Other beliefs commonly associated with conservatism in America, however, do not fit comfortably under this political label. A celebration of free market capitalism, entrepreneurialism, and economic risk-taking was central to Republican Party politics of the late 20th century. Yet this politics was not about maintaining tradition or the institutions that buttressed it. Rather, it was about disrupting traditions and upending institutions that stood in the way. Neoliberalism is a creed that calls explicitly for unleashing capitalism's power. Invoking that term allows us to shift the focus of political history in the last third of America's 20th century, somewhat away from white Southerners and family patriarchs resisting change to venture capitalists, Wall Street modernizers, and information technology pioneers seeking to push change forward. That shift in emphasis, in my opinion, is long overdue. Central to the politics of the Clinton years were major legislative packages that fundamentally restructured America's information, communication, and financial system, and whose influence on 21st century political economy has been decisive. And yet those restructurings have attracted less attention they deserve, than they deserve their significance hidden by the smoke generated by the decades fiery culture wars. Those culture wars cannot be ignored any more than the racial backlash against the civil rights movement can be slighted. But it is time to bring the project of economic transformation more into focus, to, to give it the kind of careful examination it deserves and to adjust our views of late 20th century America accordingly. A focus on neoliberalism can help us do that. Neoliberalism is a creed that prizes free trade and the free movement of capital goods and people. It celebrates deregulation as an economic good that results when markets are freed from government interference. It hails globalization as a win-win proposition, uh, proposition 
that both enriches the West, the cockpit of neoliberalism, while also bringing an unprecedented level of prosperity to the rest of the world. Some who subscribe to the neoliberal creed value the hybridization of cultures that comes from crossing borders. Cosmopolitanism is the word I attach to a celebration of different races, nationalities, and ethnicities mixing with each other. These creedal principles deeply shaped American politics during the heyday of the neoliberal order. Neoliberalism built on the principles of classical liberalism. Classical liberalism born in the 18th century discerned in markets extraordinary dynamism and possibilities for generating trade, wealth, and a rising standard of living. It sought to liberate markets from encumbrances, monarchy, mercantilism, bureaucracy, artificial borders, tariffs. It sought, in other words, to release the economy from the heavy hand of the state in its various guises. It wanted to allow people to move around in pursuit of self-interest and fortune, to truck, barter, and exchange in Adam Smith's terms as they saw fit. Classical liberalism wanted to let individual talent rise or fall to its natural level. It carried within, within it emancipatory, even utopian hopes of people freed and a world transformed. My argument for treating neoliberalism as a descendant of classical liberalism puts me somewhat at odds with those scholars who have emphasized differences between the two. The most common argument for distinction is that neoliberalism, in order to reinvigorate markets, requires far more state intervention than classical liberalism ever did. I agree with the claim that strong states are necessary to organize vibrant markets, but I dispute the contention that the turn to strong states was a development that only began with the advent of neoliberalism. The excellent work done these last 15 years by historians of 19th century US state building has revealed how the presence of a strong government with the ability to set down and enforce rules for making contracts and with the capacity to expand and protect markets through law, military force and tariffs was critical to the success of classical liberalism in the 19th century. Flourishing markets then and now require strong governments that can enforce rules of economic exchange. Markets need structure in order to operate freely. This principle was as intrinsic to classical liberalism as it has been to neoliberalism. Affixing neo to liberalism, I suggest, was less about distinguishing this liberalism from classical liberalism than about separating it from what modern liberalism in America had become, a version of social democracy. Now, admittedly, the American version of social democracy was somewhat light by Western European standards. Nevertheless, it called for a far greater intervention by the government into market mechanisms and capitalist prerogatives than what liberals in the classical mode could tolerate. This transformation in the meaning of liberalism in America was a work of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Dealers who surrounded him. They rose to power in the 1930s. Their successors in the Demo Democratic Party kept that power for another 30 years. Even when they were dislodged from power in the 1970s and 80s, the meaning they had imparted to liberalism in America endured. Liberalism in America had come to mean restraining capitalist power, redistributing wealth, erecting a gener generous welfare state, and managing the economy in the public interest. Roosevelt had engaged, in, in other words, in a kind of theft terminological theft. I regard his theft of the term liberalism for America's social democrats as one of the great termin terminological heists in modern history. It meant that those who wanted to launch a 20th century liberalism that remained true to the principles of classical liberalism could no longer use liberalism to describe their own beliefs. The theft and contamination of the term liberal infuriated Roosevelt's opponents, none more so than the leader of the Republican Party at the time, Herbert Hoover. Politicians like Hoover and later Reagan, who opposed Rooseveltian liberalism, would eventually call themselves conservatives. They saw no alternatives to embracing that label. 
But many intellectuals in their ranks, including the architects of the neoliberal world, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman, understood that conservatism with its emphasis on order, hierarchy, and embeddedness of individuals and institutions was contrary to the liberal spirit of disruption, invention, and innovation they so admired. Somehow the term liberal had to be repossessed. Invoking the term neoliberal was one way to do it. Recognizing the close kinship between classical liberalism and neoliberalism allows us to see how some who embraced neoliberal principles sought to resuscitate the promise of emancipation and individuality that was so central to classical liberalism itself. My argument that neoliberalism embodies the, that this promise has aroused skepticism among some. Many regard neoliberalism as the work of elites and their allies aspiring to economic and political power. Those who figure centrally in their imaginations are often influential intellectuals or deep pocketed billionaires in the think tanks they support or financial institutions, domestic like the Federal Reserve and international like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank operating largely free of democratic oversight. Neoliberalism from this point of view is configured as the enemy of the people and framed as a tool used by elites to subvert democracy and to undercut emancipatory movements. Interpretively, these works are driven by the conviction that elites have been the creators and disseminators of neoliberal thought and practice. In my book, I give a full accounting of the harsh elements of neoliberalism, including mechanisms of coercion it advocated in order to impose market discipline on a society. I take a full measure of the support in neoliberal ranks for pursuing capital accumulation. And I know time and again, neoliberal indifference to questions of economic equality and redistribution. But I also insist that an elite driven model for understanding neoliberalism cannot suffice to account for the popularity that its views achieved in the United States. Ronald Reagan convinced many Americans that joining his political crusade would unshackle the economy from regulation and set them free. He framed that freedom as every American's birthright. The pursuit of that freedom, he told his followers, was the reason the American Revolution had been fought, the reason the American nation had come into existence. Reagan resuscitated the emancipatory language of classical liberalism for a late 20th century audience, an act of recovery that helped to make him one of America's most popular political figures. Seeking out the sources of his popularity requires moving beyond elite-based understandings of neoliberalism and inquiring into the reasons why individuals up and down the social scale were drawn to Reagan-style neoliberal rhetoric and policies. If Reagan was a divisive figure, I'm sorry, if Reagan was a popular figure, he was also a divisive one. Just wanted to make sure you were listening. He deliberately stoked racial tensions as a way of securing his political base. As his presidency became associated with market freedom on the one hand, it encouraged a revolt against civil rights advances on the other. A disturbing discourse arose in 1980s America, depicting poor blacks as part of an underclass that was neither capable nor deserving of participation in the market economy that Reagan was so intent upon creating. These were the years in which a program of mass incarceration took shape in America, one intent upon removing hundreds of thousands and then millions of individuals, disproportionately minority, from ordinary economic activity and regular processes of market exchange. Successful experiments in freedom, the apostles of Reaganism seem to be suggesting, depended on the denial of liberty to those unable, allegedly, to handle its privileges and responsibilities. Several chapters in my book explore the spread of unfreedom amidst the advance of market freedom. This paradoxical feature of the neoliberal age, the spread of unfreedom amidst the advance of market freedom turns out to have also been rooted in the practices of 19th century liberalism. If the appeal of neoliberal policies have been confined to Reagan and his supporters, 
the problem of mass incarceration would have been addressed sooner than it was. But it turns out support for neoliberalism spilled beyond Reagan and his political precincts and into the districts of the new left, a constellation of radical liberation movements that emerged in the 1960s. A popular base for neoliberal policies, in other words, emerged not just on the right, but on the left. By left, I mean new left, not old left. The new left's engagement with neoliberal principles can be discerned in the vehemence of its revolt against what it regarded as the over-organization and bureaucratization of American society resulting from New Deal reform and in the desire to multiply the possibilities for personal freedom. The new left revolt against excessive regulation is apparent in so many forms in the 1960s and 70s. And Paul Goodman's creed occur growing up absurd, which I regarded as a Bible at the time. In the 1962 Port Huron statement that defined the early goals of the new left, in the rhetoric that Mario Savio used to frame the ambitions of Berkeley's 1964 free speech movement, an early new left moment of mass protest, in the emerging cybernetics movement that inspired the likes of Stuart Brand and Stephen Jobs, hippies in those days, to associate the creation of the personal computer with the quest for individual freedom. And in the determination of Ralph Nader and his political allies to free the consumer from repressive corporate and government elites, freeing the individual and his or her consciousness from the grip of large stultifying institutions, privileging, privileging disruption over order, celebrating cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism, and the unexpected sorts of mixing and hybridities that emerge under these regimes. All of these beliefs, each of which marinated for years in the political and culture milieu inspired by the new left, furthered neoliberal aspirations and helped to make it into a hegemonic ideological force. Emphasizing the influence of classical liberalism on neoliberalism, is one way in which my book's account of neoliberalism is, is distinctive, broadening our understanding of neoliberalism's rise beyond an elite-centered model of pol politics to include the way in which popular and left forces spread its appeal is the second way. And then there's a third way, the importance this book ascribes to international politics in creating the circumstances in which neoliberalism moved from political movement to political order. The international origins and reach of neoliberalism have been well documented by a variety of scholars. The European roots of neoliberalism in post-World War I Vienna, the home of neoliberal economists Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, have been ably explored by Angus Bergen and others. Interwar Geneva has emerged as a critical incubator for neoliberal ideas, and Mount Pellerin in Switzerland is generally recognized as a place where Hayek and others attempted to turn neoliberalism into a disciplined thought collective. Quinn Slobodian has expertly examined the role of neoliberal policies in shaping relations between the global North and the global South in the post-World War II era, especially through organizations such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Amy Offner has dissected the dissemination and impact of these policies on Latin America. And David Harvey was way ahead of everyone else and understanding the contributions of neoliberalism to the so-called Washington consensus that structured US involvement with the world during its 1990s heyday. This work forms a critical backdrop to my own study of neoliberal order in America. Generally missing from studies of the international roots and reach of neoliberalism, however, is a reckoning with the Soviet Union and of communism more generally. And yet my book argues the Soviet Union and international communism cannot be ignored. And here I have a little shout out for Benji because he's studying the Russian revolution now. Few international events in the 20th century match the Russian revolution of 1917 in importance. In the 50 years after their rise to power in Russia, Communists walled off large parts of the world, the vast Soviet Union itself, 
then half of Europe, and then China from capitalist economics. For the first third of the Cold War era, communism was a serious threat in Western Europe. For the first two thirds of the Cold War, it posed a similar threat across innumerable nations emerging in Africa and Asia and across Latin America. Fascism and Nazism can be understood in part as radical right responses to communism's rise. Meanwhile, in the United States from the 1920s forward, communism was regarded as a mortal threat to the American way of life. The Great Depression and Second World War moderated America's anti-communism, but only temporarily. No other single political force had a comparable influence on world or American politics across the 20th century. The power of and the fear unleashed by the communist threat is now largely forgotten. My students at Cambridge regard the Cold War as quaint, or at least they, they did until the invasion of Ukraine by Putin turned heads. Few accounts of neoliberalism treat the fall of the Soviet Union between 1989 and 1991 or the collapse of communism as capitalism's chief global antagonist as seminal events. But the consequences of that empire's fall and the simul simultaneous defeat of its legitimating ideology were immense. Together, they made possible neoliberalism's American and then global triumph. One consequence of communism's fall is obvious. It opened a large part of the world, Russia and Eastern Europe, to capitalist penetration. It also dramatically widened the willingness of China, still nominally a communist state in the 1990s and today, to experiment with capitalist economics. Capitalism thus became global in the 1990s in a way it had not been since prior to the First World War. The globalized world that dominated international affairs in the 1990s and 2000s is unimaginable apart from communism's collapse. Another consequence of communism's fall may be less obvious, but is of equal importance. It removed what had been an imperative in America and in Europe and elsewhere for, cl for class compromise between capitalist elites and the working classes. From the 1930s through the 1960s, communism was understood through the lens of totalitarianism, meaning it was regarded as a totalizing system of rule that once established could never be overthrown. A nation once lost to communism would never be regained for the capitalist world or so the influential theory of totalitarianism taught. That theory turns out to have been wrong, but what matters from the period from the 1930s to the 1960s is the intensity with which it was believed. Thus the specter of communist advance required from the United States, a policy of military containment unprecedented in its history. It also impelled capitalist elites in advanced industrial countries, including the United States, to compromise with their class antagonists in ways they might not otherwise have done. The fear of communism made possible the class compromise between capital and labor that underwrote the New Deal order. It made possible similar class compromises in multiple social democracies in Europe after the Second World War. The collapse of communism then cleared the world of capitalism's most ardent opponent. Vast new territories and peoples can now be brought into a single capitalist marketplace. The possibilities for growth and profits seemed boundless. The United States would benefit from this growth, of course, and perhaps the class compromise that had formed the basis of the New Deal order could be jettisoned. There was no longer a hard left to fear. The precise timing of the fall of the Soviet Union and of communism more generally, 1989 to 1991, explains why the 1990s was a more decisive decade in neoliberalism's triumph than the 1980s had been, and why Bill Clinton's role in securing neoliberalism's triumph was in some ways more important than that of Reagan himself. After 1991, the pressure on capitalist elites and their supporters to compromise with the working class vanished. The room for political maneuver by class-based progressive forces narrowed dramatically. This is the moment when neoliberalism went from being a political movement to a political order. The fall of communism, in short, forms a central part of the story of neoliberalism's triumph. 
To argue for communism's importance is not meant to rehabilitate it as a political movement. Communism, in my view, was an indefensible system of tyranny. Rather, it is meant to help us to understand the role that communism played in the century when it was a feared force, and then to call on us to reckon with the effects of its sudden and complete disappearance from international and national affairs. The very real communist threat in the period from the 1930s to the 1960s facilitated the class compromise between capital and labor that sustained the New Deal order. The disappearance of that threat between 1989 and 1991 facilitated the scuttling of that compromise and the triumph of the neoliberal order. This perspective underscores the importance of situating the history of neoliberalism and the political order it sustained in the broader context of the epic 75 year global struggle between capitalism and communism. Every political order contains ideological contradictions and conflicts among constituencies that it must manage. Neoliberalism was no exception in that regard. One contradiction I have already noted, that's that which existed between those who saw neoliberalism as a strategy for enhancing rule by elites and those who saw it as a pathway toward personal emancipation. Another lay in the uneasy coexistence within the neoliberal order of two strikingly different moral perspectives on how to achieve the good life. One which I label neo-Victorian, after Queen Victoria, celebrated self-reliance, strong families, and disciplined attitudes toward work, sexuality, and consumption. These values were necessary, this moral perspective argued, to gird individuals against market excess accumulating debt by purchasing more than one could afford and indulging appetites for sex, drugs, alcohol, gambling, and other whims that free markets could be construed as sanctioning. Since neoliberalism frowned upon government regulation of private behavior, some other institution had to provide it. Neo-Victorianism found that institution in the traditional family, heterosexual, governed by male patriarchs, with women subordinate, but in charge of homemaking and child rearing. Such families guided by faith in God would inculcate moral virtue in its members, and especially in the young and prepare the next generation for the rigors of free market life. The intellectual guiding lights of this movement in the United States, individuals such as Gertrude Himmelfarb and her husband, Irving Kristol, believed that 19th century Britain under Queen Victoria had achieved this symbiosis of family and market and that late 20th century America could achieve it again under Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party that he was fashioning. This view found a mass base in Jerry Falwell's legions of evangelical Christians, mobilized politically as part of an influential religious organization known as the Moral Majority. The other moral perspective encouraged by the neoliberal order, which I lab label cosmopolitan, was a world apart from neo-Victorianism. It saw in market freedom an opportunity to fashion the self or an identity that was free of tradition, inheritance, and prescribed social roles. In the US, this moral perspective drew, drew energy from the liberation movements originating in the new left, black power, feminism, multiculturalism, and gay pride among them, and flourished in the era of the neoliberal order. Cosm cosmopolitanism was deeply egalitarian and pluralistic. It rejected the notion that the patriarchal heterosexual family should be celebrated as the norm. It embraced globalization and the free movement of people and the transnational links that the neoliberal order had made possible. It valorized the good that would come from diverse peoples meeting each other, sharing their cultures and developing new and often hybridized ways of living. It celebrated the cultural exchanges and dynamism that increasingly characterized the global cities, London, Paris, Milan, New York, Hong Kong, San Francisco, Toronto, Los Angeles, among them, developing under the aegis of the neoliberal order. The existence of two such different moral perspectives was both a strength and a weakness 
for the neoliberal order. The strength lay in the order's ability to accommodate within a common program of political economy, very different constituencies with radically divergent perspectives on moral order. The weakness lay in the fact that the cultural battles between these two constituencies might threaten to erode the hegemony of neoliberal economic principles. The cosmopolitans attacked neo-Victorians for discriminating against gays, feminists, and immigrants, and for stigmatizing the black poor for their so-called culture of poverty. The neo-Victorians attacked the cosmopolitans for tolerating virtually any lifestyle, for, ex for excusing deplorable behavior as an exercise in the toleration of difference, and for showing a higher regard for foreign cultures than for America's own. The decade of the neoliberal order's triumph, the 1990s, was also one in which cosmo cosmopolitans and neo-Victorians fought each other in a series of battles that became known as the culture wars. In fact, a focus on these cultural divisions is the preferred way of writing the political history of America during those years. Many political scientists in America regard polarization as the key phenomenon in American politics and devote themselves to explaining how it arose and how it has shaped or rather misshapen American society. I do not deny the reality of this polarization, which ultimately would contribute to the fracturing of the neoliberal order, but this reality should not be allowed to obscure the coexistence of cultural polarization with a broad agreement on principles of political economy. This paradoxical coexistence of cultural division and political economic agreement manifested itself in the complex and fascinating relationship between Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich in the 1990s. In the media, these two men were depicted and depicted themselves as opposites sworn to each other's destruction. Clinton offered himself as a tribune of the new America, one welcoming of racial minorities, feminists, and gays. He was thought to embody the spirit of the 1960s and something of the insurgent, free-spirited character of the new left. Gingrich presented himself as the guardian of an older and truer America, even though they were the same age, basically. One grounded in faith, patriotism, respect for law and order, and family values. Both men drew immense prestige from major 1990s uh, electoral victories, that had not, the likes of which had, had not been seen in uh, America for some time. In 1992, Clinton became the first Democrat in 16 years to win the White House. In 1996, he became the first Democratic president since Roosevelt in 1944 to win re-election. In 1944, Gingrich became Speaker of the House when he masterminded the Republicans first sweep of both houses of Congress since 1952. Gingrich pledged himself and his party to obstructing Clinton at every turn to defeating him in the 1996 election or failing that to removing him from the presidency via impeachment. Gingrich almost succeeded in removing Clinton from the presidency via impeachment. Clinton, meanwhile, regarded Gingrich as the unscrupulous leader of a vast right-wing conspiracy to undermine his presidency. The two men could not stand or stomach each other. Yet despite their differences and the hatred for each other, they made a point of exhibiting, these two Washington power, power brokers worked together on legislation that would shape America's political economy for a generation. Their behind the scenes collaboration made possible the triumph of the neoliberal order. And pulling back the curtain on the 1990s, my book reveals the powerful and coherent economic accord that sustained the neoliberal order across decades of culture wars. Judging by the early reviews of my book, there is a broad receptivity to the proposition that a neoliberal order dominated American politics from the 1980s through the 20 teens. More resistance, however, has greeted my claim that the neoliberal order is indeed falling. It is, of course, somewhat perilous for a historian to write about the present and arguably foolish for a historian to predict the future, to predict the future. This is not what we are trained to do. But on the other hand, one should not avoid taking a stand on one of the key issues 
of our time. I do believe that the United States is at an inflection point in its politics. I believe much of the world is as well. I have a shorthand test for measuring the prestige of the neoliberal project or lack thereof. That test poses this question, how much authority do the, do the four freedoms of neoliberalism command? And now you're thinking, what do I mean by the four freedoms of neoliberalism? They are not to be sure the social democratic four freedoms enunciated by Franklin Roosevelt in 1941. Rather, they are the four freedoms that in my understanding are necessary for a neoliberal world to flourish. Those four freedoms can be simply stated. First, the free movement of people across borders. Second, the free and frictionless movement of goods across borders. Third, the free and instantaneous movement of information throughout the globe without obstacle. And fourth, the free movement of capital wherever it wants to go on planet Earth. Across the neoliberal heyday, these four freedoms commanded enormous authority. They were the goals to which supporters of neoliberalism aspired. What has happened to these four freedoms? Freedom of movement. I think we can say that opposition to the free movement of people across borders is intensifying everywhere. Walls and wire fences are being built. Prisons and camps for illegal migrants are multiplying. What about free trade? Protectionism was a dirty word during the neoliberal heyday. You could not utter it and stay involved in politics in America. It no longer is a dirty word. We hear more and more talk of managed trade rather than free trade. Very significantly, the Biden administration has done nothing to roll back the tariffs that the Trump administration has imposed on China. The belief that once governed international politics that free trade would encourage the spread of political freedom has been abandoned. What about the frictionless movement of information? The neoliberal world emerged from the information revolution of the 1990s, which promised a world literally bound together by the unlimited and instantaneous flow of information to every part of the globe. Now China is building an IT infrastructure meant to take that country out of the global system, or rather allowing entry only through carefully guarded digital gates. Putin and Russia and Erdogan and Turkey wish to emulate this Chinese model. A world of rival digital blocks may well characterize the world by 2050. The hardiest freedom has been the free movement of capital, its ability to move quickly and without restraint to places where it could achieve the greatest returns. However, the sanctions that the West has slapped on Russia as a result of its war on Ukraine are the most sweeping and deepest imposed on any nation since the end of the Cold War. Meanwhile, the shortages that societies and governments have experienced in essential commodities these last few years in protective equipment for healthcare workers, in vaccines, in petroleum and natural gas, in food, in computer chips, and so on, have compelled us to think differently about politics and economics. Governments everywhere are asking, what steps must be taken to ensure their nation's food and energy security? What measures must be adopted to ensure that other raw materials and goods vital to essential industries are available? Which supply chains can be trusted and which cannot? What happens if China attacks its own version of Ukraine, namely Taiwan? Increasingly, states are deciding that answers to these questions cannot be left in private hands, cannot be left to market forces. Decisions regarding what materials and goods are essential, how supply chains should be organized, who should direct investment in future industry are too important to be left in private hands. States must step in. Industrial policies developed by states are the new currency of politics, challenging the neoliberal shibboleth that in the final analysis, it is always the market that must decide. Some decisions are too important to be left to markets. The market in this newest wave of economic and political thinking is no longer supreme. Liz Truss seems not to have gotten this message. But the utter, utter bewilderment of her government and her advisors is symptomatic, I think, of how quickly the world is changing, 
how rudderless her band of neoliberal thinkers now are, how far we have already traveled from the heyday of the neoliberal order. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's easy to see when I picked up my Financial Times and read the first review of your book, it was described as an instant classic. And now I can see why that was. Um, we've got a good chunk of time for questions and discussion. Um, I just, I'll, I'll, we've got an audience online too, so I'll try to take uh, questions from here and also from the audience online. Just wait till the person comes with the microphone. I think the gentleman at the back there with the grey suit on was first. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm just curious why you localize neoliberalism at the beginning of the 1980s, when in fact the term itself was defined by Alexander Rustin at the Walter Lippmann Colloquium in 1938, I believe. And you alluded to the kind of criticism of neoliberalism, the idea that is it a elite ideology I mean, given Lippmann's anti-democratic stance for most of his career. Who, who's, I'm sorry, Lippmann's, did you say? Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann, yeah. Um, and considering his ideology really influenced the idea of neoliberalism, why is that not technically true, at least from a intellectual, intellectual history point of view? Thank you. Do I need to speak in? I the, think just, yeah. Uh, uh, you, can hear, you can hear me? Or, yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, you're absolutely right that uh, a key meeting of where neoliberalism took shape and where it acquired that name uh, was 1938 in Paris, uh, and it was called the Colloque Lippmann and Walter and organized to talk about Lippmann's uh, new book, The Good Society, uh, which seemed to a lot of Europeans to offer a middle way between the collectivism of the left and the or I should say the, the less, less between the collectivism of the left and the laissez-faire of the right. Uh, if you look, if you read the account of that um, colloquium, uh, what's impressive is that the neoliberals or the people who were there who are beginning to call themselves neoliberals are all over the political map. Um, it includes socialists, left liberals, libertarians on the right, like Fon Mises. Uh, so I, I would be the last person to deny that um, in that group and in the Mount Pelerin, Pelerin group that met in 1947, that I would be the last to deny that there were those in those ranks who conceived of neoliberalism in elite terms as a way of preserving liberal values in a world gone crazy on democratic aspiration and anarchy. Uh, but it doesn't comprehend the world that they were living in in the 1930s and 40s. And we have been misled somewhat by their determination to fashion themselves into what they called a thought collective. They imagined that they would be a disciplined band of thinkers with one ideology that they could then um, use to influence key institutions that would manage the global economy. Uh, but if you look carefully at, uh, the, uh, at their discussions in Mount Pelerin and before, there's a tremendous amount of dissent. There's a tremendous amount of un uncertainty. Uh, and there are many in their ranks who have a different view of what neoliberalism um, should be. They also do not acknowledge their similarity to classical liberalism. They never mentioned that there was actual new liberalism in Britain that preceded what they were doing. These, this was a new liberalism of um, Hodgson and Hophouse in the early decades of, of the 20th century, they were enmeshed in a series of discussions uh, regarding liberalism that uh, they sought to extract themselves from. Uh, they, they saw those discussions as messy. They wanted something clear and disciplined and coherent. But if we go back and look in the actual history of what they were talking about, it's, it's hard to find that image of themselves. And if you look at what Lippmann is proposing, in the good society, it looks a lot like the New Deal. 
if you actually read what he's proposing, it lo looks a lot like what Roosevelt is proposing. So uh, what I'm saying is that neoliberalism is very protean. Uh, it can be stretched and formed in different directions. And that when it becomes uh, popular and dominant in America in the 1970s and 80s, it includes a popular component to it uh, that is successful in achieving the consent of vast numbers of ordinary people. So it's not, it does not suffice, in my view, to simply see it as an elite strategy imposed from above. It taps into liberal dreams of freedom and emancipation that have the capacity to have a profound popular appeal. Okay, thanks. I'll just take another question from um, from here. Oop, maybe this gentleman at the back here with the brown shirt. Hi, I'm Adve. I'm a first year politics student. I know it might be foolish for historians to try and anticipate the future, but I think the natural progression from your analysis of the, of the fall of neoliberalism is what will follow. So I wanted to ask, what do you think will be the dominant features of the paradigm that will come to become the new political order? Yeah, see, I venture into the present and then I have to keep going into the future. Uh, it's a completely valid question. Uh, I should say that whatever I'm about to say, you should pay only limited attention to. I see three possibilities, one of which is, uh, two of which are quite well defined already. Uh, we can imagine um, a political order that is ethno-nationalist, authoritarian, uh, that, uh, uh, that will make its peace with capitalism, but is completely shorn of liberal elements that were important to the neoliberal order. Uh, th this is Trump, and this is a global movement. This is, this is Trump, this is Orban, this is Putin, this is Erdogan, Modi in India, Duarte in the Philippines, Bolsonaro in Brazil. They recognize themselves in each other. And we, I think we all know we have to regard this, we have to regard the possibility. If Putin were to win, for example, Let's leave aside for a moment what winning looks like. If he were to win, that would be a tremendous boost for the future of that political order, just as the defeat of Trump in 2020 in the United States was a, was a huge reversal for that. Uh, the uh, second possibility is that we live in, in an extended period of disorder, which I think characterizes the United States and Great Britain. <laughs> at this very moment, right? It, uh, the politics is so volatile, it's, it's, it's hard to discern any patterns. Uh, the dizzying pace of change and, and, you know, and what I see as the, um, the implosion and the self-destruction of the Tory party, I mean, not for all time, but it's extraordinary to watch what this, uh, what this political party is going through. Um, it's tearing itself apart. Uh, this is, um, uh, an indication of, 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 of a world that's politically profoundly disordered and how difficult it is to find our way to a new political order. The third possibility is um, some kind of um, progressive political order that harkens back to elements of the New Deal. And we can see this in, in the Bi Biden proposal and in, in the continental and in, in the EU proposal for a Green New Deal that takes that, that, that is progressive, that tries to enhance a uh, discussion between the left and center of the political spectrums in, in, in these various countries. And uh, the Biden administration has, is, is strikingly different than the Obama administration in that respect, in that the um, discussion going on between the, the left and center of the Democratic Party in the U.S. is now very productive. I'm going to a conference in New York later in this week where this is this is the agenda and progressives are now trying to imagine a long road to power of the sort that the neoliberals undertook from the 1940s to the 1970s. But this is also the most ill-defined future um, before us. And uh, for those of you who are uh, progressives in this audience or on the left of the political spectrum, this is um, one of the most urgent questions of our time. And when I speak to the left, people on the left in places like France and Italy, 
what's upsetting to them is the um, the staleness of the of progressive politics. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see now that labor has this incredible opportunity given to it by the self-destruction of the Tory party, whether it is able in this really, really important moment to fashion something that can help us imagine what a progressive political order of the future might look like. Hmm. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from the um, online audience, which sort of builds on this, I guess, at least two questioners have asked about Bernie Sanders. And I'll just, one is from an alumni from 1975, who now lives in Williamsburg, Virginia. In your opinion, would Bernie Sanders have won the 2016 presidential election if he had won the presidential primary in the Democratic Party primary? No. <laughs> on the other hand, um, Bernie Sanders has now established himself as the second most successful socialist in all of American history. Mm. And that is no mean feat. And I, had, I remember people were calling me in 2015 and tw early 2016 during the primary season and wanting to talk to me about Bernie Sanders. They had heard somewhere, I actually do know um, more about the history of American socialism than most people in the, the UK, uh, history of American socialism than most people in the UK and, and also <laughs> And a lot more than a lot of people in the US. And I was saying, uh, don't you know that a socialist can never be elected president of the United States? And some 20 year old is calling me and said, enough of that old man, you are so passe, you know, you have no idea what's coming. And uh, in some respects, I didn't know what was coming. It was a really valuable lesson in the young <laughs> instructing the old and, and, and the, the importance of youth, new ideas, new sense of uh, of possibility. Uh, and what Bernie Sanders has done is to, is to be a participant in the most significant revival of the left in American politics since the 1930s and 40s. So this is a major, major development. And we don't know quite what to make of the Corbyn era in Britain, but the, in, a, in, a, in other words, has been cut off. Is it gonna come back in some form? Uh, in America, it, it, the, 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 um, uh, the insurgency is, is still very alive and, and well. And what I referred to a moment ago, the, the discussion that Biden, it's not like Biden has become a socialist. That's not going to happen. Uh, but he feels compelled to engage with the left in serious political conversations. Uh, and the program that emerged from those conversations in the run-up to his actually taking office informed the legislation that was proposed in the first year of his presidency. So while I don't think Bernie Sanders can win the presidency of the United States, I think socialists and other kinds of leftists in America can have a profound effect on the shape of progressive politics. And historically, the Democratic Party in America has been most successful when the center of the party and the left of the party have been in productive conversation with each other. It's true of the early 20th century, um, it's true of the New Deal of the 1930s and 40s. It's true of the 1960s. Um, and it's become true again of the 19-teens and the 2020s. And so the, the, social insert, the socialist insurgency and the recuperation of a left tradition in American politics, it, it's real and it's significant. But we, the way in which to understand its influence is not in the hope that a socialist would actually be elected, but that the socialist voices would be significant and powerful enough so as to influence the shape of American politics. Right, so some, a couple more questions here. Um, can I just see who else is interested? I've got a lot of um, people, but they're all men. Can I have <laughs> this person down here on the front? Thank you. Hi. Um, so I just have a very specific question. I found it very, interested, uh, very interesting that you mentioned the four uh, fundamental freedoms of neoliberalism, that they, and they almost coincide with the four freedoms of the European single market. And uh, in this context, seeing as, as the neoliberal order is, is um, kind of receding, what future do you see for the European project? Is there any way to bypass this? Because at the same time, we're seeing as all these uh, uh, as the project is imploding with this for the same reasons. 
Well, it's an excellent question. Um, I'm not an expert on the EU. I feel like I should um, ask you to answer that question. Uh, uh, the EU um, uh, has neoliberal neo characteristics to it. Um, I think it also contains within it um, profound progressive elements. Um, and in a world where uh, borders are going up everywhere, the EU holds out some hope for um, not simply the perpetuation of neoliberalism in an archetypal form, but um, uh, incubating a progressive politics that has the ability to cross uh, borders. Uh, we know the tensions within the EU are um, are profound, especially between the uh, east and the and, and the west, or we might say the north and the and the south. Um, thinking of the recent Italian election, and I also uh, think we have to think very. The EU has to um, think very carefully about what its internal relations are to its external relations, and I think of this in regard to the issue of immigration. And so the free movement of people remains, you know, profound, a profound reality within the EU. Uh, but we also know that the German government is paying huge amounts of money to um, Greeks and 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 Turkey to house immigrants from North Africa and the Middle East in prison camps um, on Greek and 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 Turkish islands. And so one would have to so that the future of the EU is not simply about its internal relations, but how it resolves the tension between an internal set of freedoms and um, external relations. I think it's very important that um, the EU survive in some form, because I think if there is going to be a, a, a progressive political order to emerge from the world in which we live, the EU is going to have to be part of that. I'll just get you to follow up on that quickly. I mean, the first and the fourth of your freedoms were the free movement of people and the free movement of capital. And the Brexit referendum, in many cases, seems to pit those two freedoms against each other. I mean, the free movement of people was rejected by many Brexiteers, but at least the ones around Liz Truss that saw sort of Singapore on the Thames embraced the free movement of capital. So what, what does that say about the need for those three to go together? I mean, clearly the Truss government is not very successful at the moment, but would it not be possible for these neoliberals to reconfigure without the cosmopolitans? We'll see. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, it speaks to the the nature of the Brexit movement, which drew on um, uh, profoundly different elements within the British population. And I think those people who um, really wanted a stop to immigration um, uh, were um, critics of globalization and uh, and and neoliberalism. And uh, I think the authoritarianism is Britain is nowhere near as powerful as it is on the continent or in America or in other parts of the world. But there were elements of that present. Uh, I think that's a um, it's a very it's a very different sentiment than uh, those who were imagining um, Britain as a new Singapore, uh, and that drew on a very different segment of the uh, of the Tory Party. Uh, and I think the contradictions between uh, those two elements of the Brexit campaign is one reason why trust is in so much trouble now, uh, because she has, a, she's, um, the, the anti-immigrant sentiment was deeply connected to the commitment to leveling up and to uh, preserving more of the resources of British society for those who have gotten the short end of the stick for a long uh, period of time. And what her program I think embodies now is uh, the jettisoning, jettisoning of all that. And I think the incoherence of this moment has to do with um, the Brexit coalition breaking apart uh, in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very significant 
way. And I read in the Telegraph today, um, on the way down on the train, uh, uh, one of their opinion writers came very close to saying, actually, Brexit lies at the root of the country's current mess. And I have not heard someone on the conservative side of the Tory side of the political spectrum. I'm sure they're saying that in private but I've not heard them say that in public. And so uh, I think there is a coherence to free movement of capital and free movement of people and to try and split them apart as the Brexiteers have done. You can try and do that and you can have short-term success and certainly they want a big political victory, uh, but for the sake of establishing a, a political order, it has landed them in, um, I was gonna say a pot of incoherence, but what a mixed metaphor that is. It, it's, it's landed them in a, in a place they can't inhabit and, and, where, they, and where they can't succeed uh, and helps to explain uh, the mess that they're in. So some more questions um, over here. Can I just take two now, if you make them succinct, um, the woman with the hat in the fourth row or third row, and then um, this woman here. Hi. I wanted to ask if you or could just elaborate. Just say who you are. Too, oh, for, uh, yeah. Um, my name is Annabelle. I'm a master's student in global politics. I wanted to ask if you could elaborate on your comment um, at the closing about the trust government and the diminishing role of markets, because one could certainly make the arguments that it was the market who destroyed her mini budget and her government as well. Uh, there's a good question. If you just hold that question, and we just have from uh, this woman on the other side of you, behind you, right behind you. Whoop. <laughs> I was just trying to have a comment from a, a, a question from a, a female. So thank you for, for doing that first. I'm not a historian. I'm not an economist. I come from a background in oceanography and uh, I'm my name is Heidi. I'm now a third year PhD in behavioral science here. So my question is, could you comment on how all of this might have shaped our response to the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, both globally and nationally? Thanks very much. So there you are. That's a small question. <laughs> but a good one. Uh, how can markets be being repudiated um, if the markets are enforcing this unpalatable political reality on trust, right? It's a good question. Um, I thought about that a little bit. Uh, it's striking to me that um, uh, someone who is so committed to free market principles got so blindsided by the markets. Um, it's, it's a sign of the incoherence of, of the moment. And, uh, uh, and if I think to the uh, neoliberal heyday, Alan Greenspan of the 1990s and early years of the, of the, of the, of the 21st century and cooperation with the Bank of England and the connections between Wall, Wall Street and the city of London that were so pronounced in those years. Uh, this kind of crisis is very hard to imagine. Uh, so I think the, the fact that a free marketeer would be um, blindsided by the response of markets in this manner, it's one thing for Alan Greenspan to be uh, blindsided by, um, you know, the housing bubble and bust of 2008, 2009. But that was e an economic cr crisis that had political elements to it. Um, there is a, you know, there, there, there is economic hardship and stress in the wor world, but this is a political crisis in its origins. Um, and someone venturing into something that she was totally unprepared for. And when this political order was riding high, it's hard for me to imagine uh, her not being in concert with the markets. And so it speaks to me about the incoherence of the moment. And, uh, and I, if we think of what issues from this, even if, the, if everything is abandoned and the trust um, uh, project and mini budget, the, the damage done is going to endure. The suspicion of markets is going to deepen. The call for a different kind of politics has got to get more intense. Uh, and I think the emphasis on 
um, imposing some political will on markets um, in the form of, um, of state power is going to get more intense. Uh, but we have to be prepared in this moment of chaos and disorder for these sorts of events to occur uh, that are that are hard to make sense of. And so you're right to call attention to the fact that they really are hard to make sense of. The climate uh, question. Um, uh, climate, uh, the climate crisis is, um, uh, is going to, on the one hand, accelerate, I think, the demise of the neoliberal world, because what um, uh, borders are going to become, um, the refugee problems, I think there are an estimated 100 million, 60 to 80 million refugees in the world now, and that figure is probably going to double or triple over the next 40 or 50 years. These are people whose land is literally disappearing um, beneath their feet, or else they're living in areas that were once hospitable to work in agriculture and, and, and no longer are. And they have no alternative but, but to, to move. And um, this is going, and, and a lot of the refugee crisis at the US southern border is actually ecologically driven. It's not just persecution of Central American people by their regimes. It's that the regions they're living in have become um, unlivable. And so that there's, it's political and economic desperation driving them incessantly toward the northern border. And, and we can see Trump's emphasis on borders, not just some innate ethno-nationalism in his being that's been there for 30, 40 years. It's, um, it's a kind of trial balloon for a kind of policy that's got to become increasingly characteristic of, as the climate crisis identifies. And the question's got to become, given the magnitude of the refugee crisis, um, who do you let in and who do you not? And this is an issue that everyone's gonna to have to face no matter how conservative or progressive the, the political regimes uh, are. Uh, but the, 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 there's gonna be a lot of wall building and a lot of mobilization for defending one's borders and a lot of selection, um, perhaps a lot less air travel. Um, uh, long distance travel between between places there the world might become a lot more stationary uh, than it is now uh, or the borders might become much harder to um, move across uh, so that's one element of of of, of a world that uh, is um, got to become less globalized on the other hand to deal effectively with the climate crisis the world has to become more globalized because no single country can solve this issue by themselves. And I think one of the worst, most difficult issues of the climate crisis is what are the international institutions of governance? Some of you who are in MPhils or PhDs um, in international relations and affairs now, how can we call into being international institutions that can cope with the magnitude of the climate crisis? It's certainly not gonna be the United Nations. Uh, and it may be that uh, it, it will depend on China and the United States, maybe India and a couple other um, very large emitters of, of gases and, and CO2 taking steps on their own uh, to compel other parts of the world to be part of this. Uh, it's certainly got to require uh, a lot more involvement on the part of uh, states and a lot more uh, intrusion into what had been free markets. So it's going to propel us, I think, in a non neoliberal direction, even as the solution to the climate crisis is going to require a, a kind of in, international um, set of institutions that, that, that so far we do not have. Okay, I'm just going to try and squeeze in one last question, but I'll try and be succinct. We'll have to both be succinct. Lots of people have asked them from the online audience about your comments about the Soviet Union and its role. And, and rather than produce any one of those questions, can I just put it this way to you? Was that just a sui generis thing to do with the, the new, with, with, the, with the order that you described as having collapsed? Or is there something that could perform that role in moving out of the neoliberal order? 
what what would be performing the role of the USSR or the communist threat in the future? I was hoping I wouldn't be asked that question. That's a that's a great that's a great question. The um, and it goes to the heart of I think of the, the role that the Soviet Union performed. Um, uh, a uh, an alternative so scary to established elites that they were willing to compromise in a manner that they otherwise would not have been willing to do. How do we do that without reproducing the tyranny of the of the Soviet Union, which we certainly uh, don't want to do? Um, and I've been asked this question before. I, I don't know the the climate crisis, uh, planetary crisis. Um, is is uh, one thinks in the abstract um, could enforce nations and individuals and classes to compromise in the way they would not otherwise do for the sake of planetary survival. Uh, but as I've just said in response to this earlier question, it's hard to imagine what set of international institutions could take on that role and do it successfully. The last time I was asked this question, it was on a podcast with Jacobin, which is a, a radical magazine, Marx, a kind of a new Marxist magazine in the United States. And they were really interested in this question. And I finally turned it back to the moderator. I said, well, you're young, you represent the new generation. I'm the older generation. It's up to you to solve this problem for us. What do you think? So actually, let me put it to you. Because I don't, I don't, I think, I think the question is a brilliant question. What, uh, on a global scale, what can persuade groups and nations, classes to do something they're not ready to do, but they're willing to do for the sake of something worse? You could say planetary extinction, the fact that everyone lives in families and has children and grandchildren. You would think this would be enough, but no, it's not enough. It has to be transmuted into some kind of political force. So let me put it to you. Can I do that before we end, or, or, or are we going to be booted out of here? Yeah. I'm... Maybe one person has a suggestion, and then we can end. Uh, so I, I don't have an answer, but I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I think it's actually one of the most urgent questions of the time. Well, it would be a good thing for people to think about as they leave. I mean, maybe it's just worth observing that it's not the first time that that dynamic's been there. You might say that British democratization benefited from the French Revolution in a way that's not dissimilar to the way in which the European welfare state benefited from Russia in the East. So it's possible that there's such a dynamic. But I think I should. I like. I like that. I like that. That's good. <laughs> but it doesn't go forward. It goes backwards. <laughs> um, look, I, it, it remains for me to thank you very much for a really brilliant lecture. I mean, I think we've heard some very. I mean, we've often thinking about neoliberalism. We've heard some things that we've heard many times before, but we've also heard some things that are a bit unusual. I mean, we've heard that there was a, a new left wing, if you like, of the neoliberal order and that it was possible for a coexistence of these culturally polar forces within that order. And we've heard, as we've just been discussing now, about the importance of international relations and the pressure from without on creating um, change from within. Finally, I think, you know, you've tried to articulate a set of markers for what neoliberalism constitutes, the, the four freedoms, as you put it. And... Um, to try and indicate the way in which that is starting to unravel before our eyes. Well, it's hard to think of anything that's more pressing on us than to think about those things as we sit here in the United Kingdom and in other countries around the world. And so I'm very grateful that you've come and shared this with us today. And I'd like you to join me in thanking our speaker.